Yena rupang rasang gandhang shabdan sparsang shchamai tunan Ete naiva vijanati kimatra parishishyate Etad vaitat What remains here unknowable to this self, through which very self people perceive color, taste, smell, sound, touch, and sexual pleasures? This is that self asked for by Nachiketa. Shankaracharya's Tika Yena By that self which is consciousness by nature, all people, bijanati, know clearly, rupam, color and form, rasam, taste, gandham, smell, shabdam, sound, sparshan, touch, cha, and maitunan, pleasurable sensations from sex. Objection. May it not be argued that the idea, I know through the self, which is distinct from the body, etc., is not familiar to anyone? Rather, all people experience thus, I, as the combination of the body, etc., know. Answer. But this is not so. Since the aggregate of body, etc., is substantially indistinguishable from knowable objects like sound, etc., and hence it, too, is equally a knowable. It cannot reasonably be the knower. If the aggregate of body and mind, though constituted by color and the other sense objects, can perceive color, etc., then the external sense objects should be able to know each other, as also their own individual feature. But this does not tally with facts. Therefore, just as that through which red-hot iron burns anything is inferred to be fire, similarly people perceive color and other attributes in the form of the body, etc. Etena eva, through this self only, which is consciousness by nature, and which is distinct from the body, etc. Im, what? Atra, in this world. Arishishyate remains, which is unknowable to the self. Nothing remains, but everything can certainly be known through the self. The self, to which nothing can remain unknown, is omniscient. Etatvaitat This self indeed is that. What is that? That secret of Brahman which was asked for by Nachiketa in Canto 1, about which the gods also had doubts, which is different from virtue and vice, etc., which is the highest state of Vishnu, and beyond which there is nothing. That very thing which was requested thus is comprehended here. This is the idea. Svapnan tan jagari tan tan chobo yena nupashyati mahan tan vibumat manan matvadiro nashochati. Having realized that great and all pervading self through which a man perceives the objects in both the sleep and the waking states, a wise man does not grieve and the tika. Yena, that self, through which a man, anupashyati, perceives, svapnantang, the content of sleep, the sleep objects. Similarly, jagaritantang, the content of the waking state, the waking objects. Ubho, both the sleep and waking objects. All this is to be explained as in four points. Three. Matva, realizing that Mahantang Vibhumatmanang, great and all pervading self, having directly known it as identified with oneself, thus Aham Brahmasmi, 
I am the Supreme Self. Dhiraha, the wise man, Nasho Chati, does not grieve. Namaste. So way back in the first chapter of Katupanishad, this question was asked by Nachiketa that basically there is a doubt of whether a living being, when he goes to death, whether he remains existent or is destroyed. And here comes the answer that the living being is Brahman. Now, whether the empirical self, the personal self, the small self, exists, or continues to exist, or is destroyed at the time of death, is actually a separate question. But to understand that question, one has to know this answer, that Brahman is the self in all creatures, and he is the one who is the perceiver. Very important point. Brahman is the knower. He's the perceiver. He's the conscious entity in all creatures. Actually, there's no other explanation for consciousness. Huh? Ah, yeah, there's so many theories, so many half-baked speculations by the scientists and others, even religionists. But when it comes right down to it, there is only one explanation that makes any sense and also checks out in our experience. And that is that Brahman is the absolute. It is just there. There is no explanation. There is no support. But it exists eternally, unborn, undying, indestructible, unknowable, uh, unrelatable, uninferable, and this is why the poor scientists <laughs> wiggle and squiggle and scramble and speculate like anything, because they cannot accept that they cannot see the self. They cannot see, yet they are the self. This is so funny, huh? They are the self, <laughs> and they are conscious themselves, and yet, they speculate, I mean, all over the map. From consciousness is an epiphenomenon of neurological brain function to there is no such thing as consciousness at all, and it's totally an illusion, and blah, 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 blah. Only the world is real. <laughs> Idiots. Uh, who's the guy who wrote The Black Swan? Well, he, he also came up with the term anti-fragile can't remember his name right now. Oh, Taleb. He also came up with the term intelligent yet idiot. <laughs> and this perfectly describes the scientists. They're so intelligent. I mean, it's difficult to uh, penetrate their intelligence sometimes because they use so much math. Math is a secret code so that other people can't understand what they're thinking. <laughs> Well, what it boils down to is they don't know. They can't see. They're biased. They're prejudiced against anything unseeable, the invisible world. And yet, they postulate a whole invisible world of subatomic particles and magnetic and other kinds of fields and forces like gravity that act at a distance with no apparent connection. How is that possible? <laughs> they, rec they actually can't explain it. They actually refuse to even consider the fact that they don't know something, which is hubris, which always leads to a downfall. So now we see they have made so many inventions that have only made the quality of life worse. Cancer, heart disease, everything is increasing because of the crazy chemicals they introduce into the environment without testing. Huh? Why? Because it's profitable. That's all. 
So what it comes down to is just like everybody else, the so-called scientists and philosophers are just after money, power, position, titles, degrees, uh, labels, designations. Oh, those are abstract. Those are invisible. See, they actually believe in a whole invisible world, the world of language. I mean, talk about math. Wow. That's a really inscrutable, invisible world that they have created, and they believe in it like people believe in God or something. <laughs> but anyway, the self is the perceiver, and he is aware of all because he is in all and of all and with all. He cannot be separated. When I had my first enlightenment experience back in 1984, this is the vision I was given, that the self, Brahman, pure consciousness, is within all, and all is within him at the same time. Yes, it's paradoxical. It's not really understandable by the intellect, but that's the way it is. So we have to accept it. And so he says, this is that, etad vaitad, etad vaitad. This is the answer to the question that you asked. You wanted to know the secret? Well, here it is. This is it. Everything up to now has been preliminary. Now he's going to describe Brahman directly. And what's the first thing he says? That it is the perceiver. It is the consciousness in all beings. That is the most important quality of the self. And everybody is conscious. So everybody actually knows the self. It's just that according to their ideology, they don't want to admit it. Because that would mean that so many of their so-called scientific and theological speculations are wrong. But they can't do that because of their pride. Huh? because they have these big institutions, these big organizations with, you know, millions of dollars and thousands of followers and all of this. And so they can't give the secret directly. Huh? You look at these big commercial gurus. They never say this. They never say the self is the perceiver in all creatures. They never say aham brahmasmi. I am Brahman. Or if they do, then they twist it around in some way to mean that, well, I may be Brahman, but you're not. So you need to study with me and then give me more donations. <laughs> I think this is unethical. I think this is unbecoming for a so-called wise person. And that we should just uh, gently remind them of this fact by withdrawing our support. So the real knowledge is always given privately, personally, one-on-one, -on -one, and with no talk of money or donations or join my organization or support my temple or, you know, do this or do that. Although, having said that, if the disciple voluntarily wants to help out, that will only accelerate his advancement. That is my experience. How did I become qualified for that experience in 1984? I served my guru well. And because of that, I got all kinds of knowledge, which my other god brothers, with the access to the same information, did not get. Why? Because they were distracted by the politics of organization. They got mixed up in the external world. Now, we're almost out of time, but I want to bring up the objection that's made in the Tika that most people think I, as a body, am aware of things. And of course, this is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because the body is also an object of consciousness. If the body is an object of consciousness, how can it be the knower? <laughs> how can it know things if it itself is something known? See? And Shankaracharya goes on to argue that 
if the body was able to perceive things by itself, well, then the objects of conscious, the other objects of consciousness, such as sight, sound, smell, etc., ought to be able to perceive each other, because they are also objects of consciousness. So why not? <laughs> but of course, that's absurd. We know that color and sound and form are not perceptic. They don't have consciousness. Huh? And in the same way, the body is also an object of perception. It's something different from the self. It is perceived. It is made. It is born. Therefore, it will die. And that which is temporary cannot be the self, by definition. So, those who think that the body is conscious are really just animals, pashu. They're not worth our consideration. We don't, we don't even think about them. But then, when they uh, somehow or other get position in a religious or spiritual organization, they mislead others. But that's the danger of it. So, you know, you have people like uh, Osho Rajneesh uh, teaching all, of the, all this very sophisticated nonsense, then he never says anything about the self. In fact, he says, if you become enlightened, your self will disappear. Well, obviously, he's talking about the empirical self, but he doesn't clarify that. So people are misled, and their ego is diminished, and they're, they're very easily misled and exploited and so on. And this is typical of all organizations of any kind. So finally, if one realizes that self, which is the perceiver of everything, I mean everything everywhere, all, all the time, even during sleep, then he does not grieve. This is also our experience. If someone it realizes that self, aham brahmasmi, I am the self, then what cause is there for grief? The body is destined to die. So, so what? The body is not the self. It's all right. Let it go. The world is on its way to hell, it looks like. But so what? That's not the self either. No matter what happens, the self will survive. Self is indestructible. So if one identifies with the self alone, all his values are going to change. He's not anymore going to be terrified of the changes in the material world up to and including death. Instead, he's going to be like, oh, well, this world is crazy, but so what? It's not me, it's not mine, it's not under my control. Huh? This is all simply, uh, well, talk about epiphenomena. <laughs> the world is an epiphenomenon of the existence of the self. The self doesn't create it. But because of the presence of the self, it comes into being somehow or other. And we'll discuss this in much greater detail when we get into Brihadar and Yakopanishad in the next series. But for right now, the first thing to know about Brahman is that it is the perceiver unconditionally in all bodies, in all places and times. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>